All right. Hello, and welcome to the next um, series of training for the Community Table series that is sponsored by Anthem Medicaid and the Coalition for the Homeless. We would like to thank our partners, Anthem Medicaid, in helping us provide this training um, to pay for our lovely speakers and um, also allowing us to be free to anyone who would like to register and attend training. So thank you Anthem Medicaid for that. Today we're going to be discussing how to um, understand and recognize domestic violence um, with our speaker, um, Jane Burnell, who is the supervisor of Southern Indiana programs at Center for Women and Family. Jane, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the floor. Hi, welcome everyone. As you're rolling in, please go ahead and put your name, the title and role that you have at your agency, how long you've been there, um, and a personal role if you feel like sharing. I'm going to pause for about 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds while you get those in your brain, and then I'll introduce myself using those same prompts. I get to know each other in the chat a little bit if you don't know each other. It's okay if you're shy, I won't call on you. Well, as you're typing those in, hopefully you can remember those. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. So as Danielle said, um, my name is Jane Burnell. I'm the supervisor of Southern Indiana programs at the Center for Women and Families. I supervise people who are doing case management, who are supporting survivors of IPSV and human trafficking. Um, I also do trainings out in the community like this. I help plan events. I do a little bit of everything as most people in social service do. I've been at the center just over seven years, but in my current role, just over two. Um, so I've been here quite a bit. It's been most of my professional career and a personal role. As you can see from this photo, I am a pet parent. Um, this is just one of my fur babies. I have five dogs, four cats and a fish. Um, so I always have one of those fuzz rollers handy as soon as I walk into work. Another personal role I'm leaning into right now is runner because I'm training for the Derby mini marathon. It's going to be my first time running that far. So I'm really nervous, but hopefully it'll be exciting. And thank you all for some of the people that have written in the chat. Appreciate it. All right. So I think it's really important to start trainings with why we're here. Um, it's really important to begin any time together with our purpose. And so I'm here because I know how prevalent interpersonal violence is in our community and among the people that we serve day in and day out. People who have experienced violence in the context of an intimate relationship face a unique set of barriers and challenges to being safe and supported both by their families and friends and the service providers that they interact with. Intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking which I will often shorten to IPSVHT, affect huge swaths of our community and often intersect with marginalized communities, such as people who are homeless or houseless. I hope that after these webinars, all throughout April, you're a little more comfortable with supporting someone who has experienced inter interpersonal violence because everyone has a part to play in making our community safer and in supporting survivors. Here's what I hope that you learned today. Increase our understanding of IP SVHT dynamics and increase awareness of how those dynamics affect marginalized populations. As you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. If we have time at the end, I will answer some. Otherwise, um, a mass email will be sent out afterwards with the answers. All right. So this is the definition of intimate partner violence that we use at the Center for Women and Families. Um, and IPV is a pattern of behaviors used by one person to gain and maintain power and control over another person in an intimate relationship. So the key part about this definition is it's a pattern of behaviors. 
Yes, any incident, whether it be yelling, a physical assault, or subtle put downs are never okay, but those behaviors on their own don't constitute IPV. It's the sum of those behaviors that is intimate partner violence. Power and control really boil down to one person's needs, wants, values, beliefs, and ideologies being more important and taken as um, more important than another person's. A relationship like that often looks like little compromise or little give and take. So that's one way to recognize it. As I read some of these statistics aloud, I want you to write your reactions in the chat. Think about what surprises you or what catches your attention potentially. So first, one in four women and one in seven men experience physical violence, sexual violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their, relation, in their lifetime. An abuser's access to a firearm increases the risk of domestic violence homicide by 500%. Partner violence is most commonly experienced by 18 to 24 year old women. And lastly, nearly half of all female victims of homicide are murdered by a current or former partner. Now I'm gonna look at the chat, to see if anyone has any reactions that they said. Is there anything? sticking out at you. No, doesn't look like it. All right. So I want you to keep some of those statistics in mind, um, especially the um, the statistic about homicide that will come up later. This is a depiction of our power and control wheel. Um, you will get an emailed version of a clearer version of this after the webinar. Um, but it shows the different kinds of abuse that could constitute power and control. Often when we think about domestic violence, we think about physical abuse, um, but that isn't the only thing that is required in order for it to be intimate partner violence. It can be intimate partner violence even if there is no physical abuse, if some of these other pie pieces, if some of the behaviors in these other pie pieces are present. Um, so if it's a little difficult to see, um, some of the categories are intimidation, isolation, psychological abuse, physical abuse, using privilege, financial abuse, verbal abuse, and sexual abuse. So an abuser could be using just one of the behaviors on this pie piece, or they could be using all eight. It just depends. So a couple of the key points I want to make here. Um, isolation and intimidation can often be where this power and control starts. Um, isolation looks like limiting contact with friends or family, not letting people um, call their friends or family back or monitoring their calls when they are talking to them, um, not letting them go to family events, things like that. Um, and then intimidation is imposing fear by using looks and gestures, destroying possessions, uh, punching walls. Often that's a precursor to physical violence. If someone is breaking items around a victim, then that can be an indication that intimate partner violence may be ramping up or making threats involving children. So that's intimidation. Financial abuse is another one that can be tricky to um, remedy, at least in the short term. So that could be making a person work all the time and taking all of their money or not letting them work at all and monitoring how much they spend so that they can't save any, um, so that they have no option but to stay with the person that they're with. Um, so financial abuse can get really tricky really quickly. Around the outside of this power and control wheel, we have the cycle of abuse. So the cycle of abuse starts with a honeymoon phase. Um, where everything is happy, everyone is doing well, good things are happening, there are gifts, you're falling in love, all of those things are happening in the honeymoon phase. 
And then as you exit the honeymoon phase, there's a tension building phase where you start, where a person may start to walk on eggshells, where it may feel like the air is thick and tense, where you're trying to tiptoe around another person's reactions to things, trying to make them happy, but nothing is working. And so this tension building phase could last anywhere from a few years to a couple of weeks to even just a few hours, depending on the relationship. Then after the tension building phase, something snaps and there's an incident. So that could be any of the incidents on this power and control wheel. It could be a physical incident where you get where someone gets hit or kicked. Um, it could be a sexual violence incident. It could just be yelling or screaming at someone. Um, so an incident happens, then usually the abuser feels bad, tries to apologize, gives gifts. I'm so sorry, it will never happen again. Honeymoon phase happens and then the cycle starts over. So one of the reasons why it can be so difficult for people who are in a potentially violent relationship is they are looking for that honeymoon phase. They're looking for that happiness. They want the person that they fell in love with to come back and give them gifts and shower them with affection. And they want to go do things together. They're looking for that high. And so that can make dealing with the lows a little bit easier. Um, this cycle can happen, like I said at the beginning, over years, it could happen over days, it could happen over hours. Usually, the longer someone is in an intimate partner violence relationship, the faster this cycle goes. Um, and the more incidents happen and the more violent or escalating the incidents are. All right, now this is another place where I'm gonna ask for some participation. So in the chat, I want you to list as many risks as you can think of for someone staying in an abusive relationship. So one in which some or all of the behaviors we just talked about on the power and control wheel are present. I want you to list as many as you can think of. Risks of staying in an abusive relationship. You can just write, yes, death, thank you. What else? Yep. And these are any risks. This could be small. This could be big. So we went to the big one first. We've got death. What other risks are there? Control, yeah. Power and control will continue to be there. What can control look like? Fear, absolutely. That plays into intimidation. It could also be fear of losing kids or fear of not having somewhere to live. Trauma for children, you could be homeless. Yep, self-harm. Monitoring movement, yeah. There are a lot of people who are reporting that people are using the eye tags or the Apple tags to control people's movement to see where people are which is really scary because they're really tiny. What else? Trauma in the children. Starvation, yeah. Some other things people have listed before have been um, involvement by CPS or DCS with the kids, um, not having financial stability or not being able to work, um, being continued to be isolated, not having any friends or family, abuse to the children themselves. All right. Codependence. Yeah. It, that becomes the new normal. So if you're in an abusive relationship and that's what you know, and that's what you're used to, then that's what you're going to continue to put up with. All right. So we got some risks of staying. What are some risks of leaving? 
And I'll switch our brains a little bit. What are list as many risks as you can think of for leaving an abusive relationship where isolation may be happening, where financial abuse is happening, where physical abuse may be happening? Yes. Death. Excuse me. More likely to be killed. Mm -hmm. Which we'll get to. Not being able to provide for yourself. Yeah. If you weren't able to work and you don't have um, a job history, it may be harder to get a job. What else? Harassment. Yes, harassment, retaliation from the abuser or perpetrator. Which could also be happening while you're in the abusive relationship. Losing family support systems. Yeah, so if you were really connected, if your abuser is really connected with your family and they are charming and charismatic enough to turn them against you which often happens, which is part of the isolation, harm to the children, hmm? psychologically and or physically. See if we can get a couple more. Loss of housing, they may try to harm the clients friends or family to get to the client. Absolutely. So when we're thinking about these two lists, you guys just listed a bunch of stuff. What do you notice about the two lists? Are they really different? All of these behaviors are, yeah, they overlap. They are very similar, very similar. And I'm glad that, I'm sad that you know this, but I'm also glad that the group put death on both sides of staying and leaving um, because one of the most dangerous times in an abusive relationship is when you're leaving or just after you've left. So almost 70% of DV murders occur after the relationship has ended. Most of them happen not while they're still in the relationship. Most happen after it has ended. Homicide is the leading cause of death for pregnant women in the United States. I don't have states. I don't have statistics for all pregnant people. It's focused on women. Um, but homicide is the leading cause of death for pregnant women in the U.S. as of 2022. So that was just last year. Um, and the most dangerous times are when one partner is pregnant. So that can add additional stress to a relationship which can increase the tension. And thank you, Tamika. Yes, they may actually be able to get away, which is positive. Yes, there are positive things to leaving. Um, so when we're talking to someone who is considering leaving an intimate partner violence relationship, it's important to say, not to say you should just leave because that is not helpful in many situations, especially if someone hasn't weighed the pros and cons of that, because just leaving can be and usually is more dangerous than staying in the relationship if you don't have a plan. So here are some barriers to leaving. Shame or social acceptance. When we're thinking about relationships, usually one of the first questions that we ask is, oh, how long have you all been together? And so the longer someone has been with their partner, the more acceptable or the better the relationship is. So if you've been married for 20 years, it can be really hard to, to divorce that person and then start over with a new person. That can feel shameful and it may not be as accepted, especially if you think about the religion piece. Some religions frown on divorce um, and some cultures frown on divorce too. Money. So we talked a little bit about financial abuse. It can be difficult to leave if you don't have anywhere to go or any money to be able to get a hotel or to get a an apartment of your own. Kids, you want your kids to have a co-parent. Um, they may not be able to afford daycare or maybe the, co the other parent is um, part of the daycare situation. So kids can throw an additional wrench into things religion, we just talked about that a little bit. Immigration status, that in general can add more layers to um, 
a situation where you're leaving, especially if a green card is involved, it's possible that the perpetrator or abuser has kept their passports or their green cards or their social security cards hidden from them or maybe even destroy them so that they're less likely to leave. For LGBTQ survivors, there's also the fear of being outed. If they're not out to any of their friends or family, um, or if they're just exploring their sexuality or gender identity, that could be scary, especially in today's climate. Um, the perpetrator promises to change. So when I talked about the power and control wheel and the cycle of abuse, that promise to change is really hopeful in the eyes of a survivor. They want the person that to come back to them. They want that person to be good and they believe that they can change and they want them to change. So they believe that. In love, I don't know any person who has gotten into a relationship um, that didn't get into that relationship because at least they liked them in the beginning. And at, the longer you're with someone, the more likely you are to love them. And so it, you can't just turn off feelings because someone hurts you. And so that is another reason why people stay in a relationship um, because they love them. All right, so what makes a person vulnerable to intimate partner violence? Here are some of the general reasons. They may struggle with substance or alcohol misuse. They may have a disability are transgender or gender non-conforming, specifically a woman in the queer community. They may be experiencing houselessness or poverty, Native American or Black, or have a diagnosed mental illness. Partially because vulnerability translates into more things to exploit and more reasons not to leave in a perpetrator's eyes. So it can be, in their eyes, easier to prey on these kinds of people. Some other statistics that aren't listed up here, specifically about the queer community um, and BIPOC communities, 26% of gay men and 37% of bisexual men experience rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner, compared to only 29% of straight men. So that's a bit, almost 10% jump. 44% of lesbians and 61% of bisexual women experience um, interpersonal violence by an uh, intimate partner compared to only 35% of straight women. So this specifically a woman in the queer community here. Um, and 87.5% of BIPOC reported experiencing other types of violence, physical violence being the most common. And BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, people of color. That is a high percentage. Another thing that isn't often thought about with intimate partner violence is pet abuse. Um, so there was a pause act that was created. It helps victims of domestic abuse find the means to escape their abusers while also keeping their animals safe because many people stay in their, in their relationships because um, they can't take their pets with them or they fear their pet safety if they leave. Um, and if you're someone like me who has many pets, it can make it even more difficult. So 85% of women and 63% of children seeking shelter reported animal abuse in the home. That's a lot. Um, one study of families under investigation for suspected child abuse. In one study, of families under investigation for suspected child abuse from CPS. Researchers found that pet abuse had occurred in 88% of those families, 88%. Animal abuse often parallels human abuse, including physical, sexual, psychological, and neglect. And animals may also have similar trauma responses and experiences to their human counterparts. So they could have unexplained injuries, behavior changes, failure to thrive, withdrawal, hostility and lack of trust, desperate to please anyone who shows them kindness. And they may even show love for the person that's hurting them. 
So if a person similar to how if an abuser starts punching walls or breaking things, if they start hurting the pets in the family, that is also an indication that intimate partner violence is going to escalate. So mandated reporting. Um, in Kentucky, it is a mandated referral if you know someone is experiencing spousal abuse. So that means you just need to get them connected with the Center for Women and Families. It used to be a report to APS, but that's not true anymore. It's just a referral to the Center for Women and Families. That could be giving them our phone number. That could be giving them our address to be a walk-in. That could be calling with them. So that's all that means. We also have a duty to warn if there's homicidal or suicidal ideation, and that's anyone in Kentucky. So that is calling the police or other authorities. Elder abuse or abuse to a vulnerable adult is required to call APS. And then child abuse, specifically for intimate partner violence situations, if the child was in the arms of the parent that was harmed, or in a room where a weapon was used, and a weapon could be any object used other than hands or fists or feet. Um, so that could be a chair, it could be throwing a phone, any of those things. If they are in the room when a weapon is used, that is also a mandated report. Anything outside of that isn't mandated, but as we're all advocates and we all want people to be safe, you can use your best judgment whether or not um, you are going to call the Child Protective Services or uh, DCS. All right. Now we're going to transition from IPV to SV, sexual violence. So sexual violence is the umbrella term, and it's de defined as sexual contact directed at a person without their consent. And consent always must be clear, coherent, freely given, and ongoing at all times. So clear, easily understood between each party. There should never be a misunderstanding or a maybe. Coherent sexual activity can't be done under the influence of anything. That includes alcohol or drugs, including prescriptions. It must be freely given. It can't be coerced. And every party has to have a choice in having a sexual interaction and then ongoing at every point in a sexual interaction there should be a consent check-in that each party confirms yes i do want to keep doing this or yes i want you to do this to me or can i do this to you yeah. as a relationship gets longer and you get to know a person more the enthusiastic yes looks different because you start to recognize a person's patterns and a coy smile can mean something different in a marriage than it does across the room at a party. Um, so make sure that you are you are understanding what yeses mean and five no's and a yes is still a no. A maybe is a no and I'm not sure is a no, especially with people that you don't know. So rape culture is a society whose social attitudes are whose social attitudes have the effect of normalizing and trivializing sexual assault which places the blame on a victim's choices or behavior instead of a, an abuser or perpetrator's choices and behavior. So when you're looking at this pyramid from 11th principle consent tolerance of behaviors at the bottom sexist attitudes, catcalling, stalking, boys will be boys type stuff, supports or excuses the things that are higher up. So if we want to start dismantling rape culture, we have to be active bystanders when the things at the bottom are happening in communicating that those things aren't okay with us or um, communicating that those things are entirely wrong always so that we can begin to dismantle the attitudes that hold up um, contraceptive sabotage, stealthing, molestation, drugging, and rape. We still do live in this rape culture 
Um, and so we have to every day intentionally try to counteract these things at the bottom. So in addition to living in a rape culture, there are some other barriers to reporting a sexual assault to the police or to the hospital. Shame, guilt, and embarrassment. If I asked you all right now, one by one, to tell me about your last sexual encounter in detail, and you would have to tell me that over and over again so that people knew what was happening, that would probably feel uncomfortable and you probably wouldn't want to do it. But that's exactly what we ask survivors to do when they go in for a safe, a sexual assault forensic exam, when we ask them to talk to the police, when we ask them to call our crisis line and talk to us. Um, so we have to be sensitive to that. So that is 100% a barrier. Perceived negative consequences. Some of the things that you mentioned as barriers to leaving an IPV relationship could happen if someone um, reports a sexual assault, so potential retaliation, um, or they could lose a friend group, they might get kicked out of school, they might not be believed, all of those things may happen, and so those are perceived negative consequences. Fear of retaliation as part of that. Lack of resources. Maybe they don't know that the center exists or that other rape crisis centers exist. Or if they do report, they may lose housing or financial situation or access to certain things. Disbelief in successful prosecution. If they report what's going to happen, possibly nothing. Distrust in the legal system, either because of um, stories that they've heard from other people that have interacted with the justice system or because they've interacted with them before and nothing has happened. Cultural language barriers. I personally only speak English. We do use a um, interpreter line at the center, but if someone answering the phone is only speaking in English and you don't speak English, that could be another barrier to telling your story. And even with an interpreter, that is a second person that's hearing your story in addition to the um, crisis line worker or the person at shelter. The last barrier is most sexual assaults are committed by someone that the victim knows. 39% are committed by an acquaintance, 33% by a current or former intimate partner, 6% by more than one person or they can't remember, just over 2% by a non-spouse relative. Only 19% are committed by a stranger, someone they didn't know. And so this can be a barrier because the victim could lose a caregiver. Their family could not believe them or they could take the abuser's side. It could disrupt family dynamics or a friend group dynamics. You could lose a co-parent. If you know, if they know you, it could be easier to retaliate. Possible there's nowhere else for that person to live. And you may see that person at events or at family functions, uh, potentially, which could be re-traumatizing. We talked quite a bit about barriers to reporting, but there are also reasons why survivors do choose to report. So 28% report to protect the household or a victim from further crimes by the offender. 25% say to stop the incident or prevent recurrence or escalation. 21% say to improve sur police surveillance or because they believe they had a duty to do so. 17% to catch, punish, and or prevent the offender from reoffending. And then 3% did so to help or recover, to get help or to recover from loss. So technically, to get support at the Center for Women and Families or many other rape crisis centers, someone has to say the words, I have been assaulted or I have been raped or someone hurt me. And so in order to get that help, 
we have to know that you've experienced IPSV in some way. So that's still reporting. It is a lower level, sometimes lower stakes way of reporting because we aren't connected to the police where they would have to report something like that. Um, but it is still something that they would have to say and could be a reason why someone reports. You get access to more resources that way. Some statistics about sexual assault. From rain every 68 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. And every nine minutes, that person is a child, someone under the age of 18. Over half of women have experienced sexual violence involving physical contact during her lifetime. And almost one in three have experienced, one in three men have experienced that. What makes a person vulnerable to sexual violence? Hopefully you recognize this is the same slide in a different color um, from the intimate partner violence slide. Marginalized populations in general have higher rates of reported violence. Some other statistics specifically about sexual violence. 22% um, of bisexual women have been raped by an intimate partner compared to only 9% of straight women reported. 40% of gay men and 47% of bisexual men have experienced sexual violence other than rape compared to 21% of straight men. So that's double. 46% of bisexual women have been raped compared to 17% of straight women and 13% of lesbians. And then in 2015, a US transgender survey found that 47% of transgender people are sexually assaulted at some point in their lifetime. So almost one in two. Among people of color, um, American Indian people um, have experienced are more likely to be sexually assaulted, um, especially if they're transgender. So American Indian, multiracial, Middle Eastern, and Black respondents of that trans survey were more likely to have been sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And this statistic I found interesting. Um, for every Black woman that reports rape, at least 15 do not. And then 17% of Latin, Latino women experience sexual victimization. We will end our presentation talking about human trafficking. So trafficking is a crime against a person's basic right to freedom. And it's the fastest growing business of organized crime. It's third after drugs and firearms trafficking. And it is one of the most, one of the fastest growing businesses because people can be bought and sold multiple times. Drugs and firearms can only be bought or sold once. Overall, it grosses $150 billion per year. And sex trafficking alone grosses $99 billion per year. So the FBI uses this model, the AMP model, act means purpose, to um, determine whether or not they are seeing human trafficking. So there has to be the act of buying, obtaining, recruiting, transporting, and or providing a human being through force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of exploitation of labor, services, marriage, or commercial sex. So all three of those things have to be present for it to be human trafficking, unless it's someone under the age of 18. Then force, fraud, or coercion does not have to be present. That's human trafficking. That's how someone can be convicted of human trafficking. 
Where, who, and how. So the top three professions, um, there are more that a victim could be forced into, but these are the most common. Escort services, pornography, and massage health and beauty services. Different types of recruiters, the most common, 33% are a family or caregiver, 28% are an intimate partner, 22% are an employer, and the primary recruitment location online. Everything happens online. Um, often online can be safer for sex workers. Um, and so that is one place where recruiters go to find people. There's a quote from a survivor from another training that I attended recently that said, for me, prostitution wasn't an option or a choice. It was a way of life, a generational thing. My mother was my first trafficker. Family and caregiver is a big one. Traffickers will identify and leverage their victims' vulnerabilities to create dependency. So similar to how abusers of IPSV will, they will meet their victims' real or perceived unmet needs. Um, so recent migration or relocation, if you don't know where things are, if you don't know who can help you, if you're unfamiliar with the area, that can make someone more vulnerable to experiencing trafficking, a mental or physical disability, substance use or misuse. Um, if you, if someone is already using substances, it can be easier to say, well, I'm not going to give you your um, heroin unless you do this for me, for example. Um, unstable housing. If it's really cold outside and you don't have a roof over your head or you're not sure where you're gonna go, it can be easier for an abuser to say, well, you can stay with me, but you have to have sex with me first, or but you have to clean my house or things like that. And then runaway or houseless youth. Often that number is disproportionately LGBTQ um, because they don't have support at home. Um, but leverage a victim's vulnerabilities to create dependency, like I said at the beginning, if someone is look, if someone is coming from an abusive household and is looking for love, is looking for support, is looking for someone to care about them, and that trafficker does that, then they can start to ask other things of that person, um, which can lead to trafficking. And another statistic: um, forty percent of trafficking survivors are Black women and girls. So again, marginalized populations. Here's the human trafficking power and control wheel specifically. So it has the same pie pieces that the IPV control power and control wheel does, but it gets a little bit more specific. Um, things like for isolation, keeping them confined, making sure they distrust police or others, making an us versus them mentality. Um, denying access to children, family, and friends or using them as leverage. Um, economic abuse is creating a debt that can never be paid, kind of indentured servitude type thing, taking the money that they earned. And then denying, blaming, and minimizing. This is um, denies that anything illegal or exploitative is happening places the blame on the victim, like, well, you wanted to stay here, so this is what you have to do to do that. Or, yeah, this is what everyone who stays with me does, making it normal, normalizing it for them. This will also be in the email following the webinar.
When we meet with our clients, they're not just houseless or a victim or a survivor or a parent or a Black person or a woman. They are all of their identities at once. And as service providers, we really have to recognize the power dynamics at play when we're interacting with them. And so the social ecological model, or the SEM, is one way that we can visually represent how a person's environment and norms and ideologies of a society influences them and how an individual influences their environment. So at the individual level, a person has their own values and beliefs that contribute to the way they move in the world. This includes mental health, substance use, the way they perform their gender identity, and past and current trauma as some examples. Moving out to the next circle at the relationship level, this speaks to the people that a person interacts with, their friends, the family, the accounts they follow on social media, the celebrities that they emulate, intimate partners, roommates, the barista that they see every morning, and service providers. So each person that we interact with has their own values and beliefs that affect how they interact with us and how we interact with them. Then at the community level, we're talking about social and physical environments that we exist in. So workplaces, schools, neighborhoods, online forums or groups, shelter communities. Uh, we also tend to surround ourselves with people who accept us and reject people who have vastly different ideologies than ourselves in general. So that can create um, a, a more of a sense of community. And then at the societal level, at the biggest level, there are the norms, laws, values, and stereotypes that the creator communities prescribes to. What is generally acceptable and normal for um, how people behave. This is where isms come into play. So things like racism, sexism, colorism, colonialism, ableism, and others, there are 12 of them. Those structural ways of thinking set up the stage for everything else. So in the graphic, you can see that societal is the biggest and it encompasses all of them. So what's happening in the society affects the community, which affects the relationship, which affects the individual and vice versa. So what the individual is doing affects relationships, which affects community, which affects the society. So it's all interconnected. Um, and an individual choice can be affected by societal norms, values, and beliefs, but that doesn't take personal responsibility away from an individual who makes a harmful choice. So it's still that individual's responsibility to um, repair and reassess what they have done and take the consequences of that choice, even if we understand the way that society um, influence that choice. Another layer in the individual level is intersectionality. So each person that we work with is the culmination of their own life experiences, their beliefs, values, and identities, and that makes them entirely unique. The way that we support someone may look different based on that, and it should look different based on that. There is not a one-size-fits-all way of supporting and advocating for survivors. So making sure that we each are culturally humble, curious, and aware of the many ways that societal norms and ideologies affect our own biases and assumptions is key to supporting clients adequately and making sure that we are all effective advocates. As a reminder, here's what I hoped that you would learn about today. And I ask that you take this information that you learned and use it to reflect on the clients you served with these questions. How are you already supportive of clients who have experienced IPSBHT? In what ways have you unintentionally perpetrated harmful norms or stereotypes about survivors? And what is one thing that you can do better in this week? So as a result of this information, I want you to think about those things. How are you already supportive of clients who have experienced intimate partner and sexual violence and human trafficking? How have you unintentionally harmed them? 
And then what's at least one thing you can do better? If you want to put your call to action in the chat so that others can see what you're going to do, please do. In addition to that call to action, um, I want you, I ask that you participate in Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month activities that are happening all throughout April, so SAP them. If the weather holds off tomorrow, there's going to be an awareness walk at the Big Four Bridge called Communities Walk Free from SV at 12 p.m. April 5th. We're going to make signs bringing awareness to the prevalence of sexual violence and walk across the walking bridge with our signs. The Indiana side and the Kentucky side are going to meet in the middle for a picture. There's also going to be a chalk the walk event on April 12th. So get some chalk and write some positive message on the messages on the sidewalk outside of your home or office so that survivors know that we believe and support them and send pictures of your artwork to training at cwfempower.org. Also, you can check the center social media for more information in case tomorrow's event is rained out. If you or someone you know is potentially in an abusive relationship or isn't sure if they're in an abusive relationship and just wants to talk, please call our crisis line at any time. We are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including holidays at 1-844-237-2331. And I want to thank you for listening to me today. If you have any questions or comments, please pop them in the chat or send an email to the address above and someone will get back to you. Thank you, Jane. And we have lots of um, thank yous in the chat. And thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, as always, we want to thank those who registered to attend today's training and also our partners at Anthem Medicaid for making this possible. Um, this month, um, to help bring awareness to sexual assault, um, we are hosting a community table series every Tuesday at noon with the Center for Women and Families. And next week's topic, correct me if I'm wrong, Jane, will be safety planning. Um, recognizing and responding and bystander intervention. There we go. Um, for next week's topic, please feel free to join us next Tuesday at 12 p.m. And then again, every Tuesday in the month of April at 12, we'll be hosting a community table series with Center for Women and Families. So thank you to Center Women and Families for all the work that you do. And thank you, Jane. We hope everyone has a good day. Thank you all. Bye. Jane, I'm gonna go ahead and close us out, okay? And I'll see y'all next week. Bye, thank all you. Right. Thanks. Bye.